Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at what we might expect to see in Blender over the course of this year, 2024. So what we're going to do is read for a blog post written by Delay. Delay is basically a manager in the Blender development team. I'm not sure if that's the correct job title. It kind of seems like in the dev team a lot of people take up multiple roles. But anyway, Delay does a lot of blog posts kind of keeping people updated on progress of Blender, sharing conceptual ideas about different types of features and what they might look like in the future. So I did this last year as well, just taking a look through. Some people seem to find value in me sharing my opinions about it and I'm sure there's going to be quite a bit of stuff in here that a lot of you have been looking forward to. Grab a drink, keep me on in the background if you like, and let's get into it. So one star to note is that obviously Blender development is quite a complex thing. There are so many different projects, I will speak about this in the blog post, but it's become quite apparent to me over especially the last two or three years that having so many different projects brings up a lot of um, conflicting opinions in the community and a lot of, um, I don't want to say broken promises, but promises which the timeline given and the actual point of release for a certain feature is quite dissonant, if that makes sense. So 2023 was a remarkable year. We started new projects, continued others, finalized several, and postponed some. There is a pattern over the years that surfaced once again. There are too many projects. This is true, and obviously there are some people that are passionate about certain types of projects, like the Blender game engine, uh, who still continuously ask for it to come back. And it kind of feels like, obviously, since there are so many things going on for Blender right now, that you know adding more things into that would be impractical. And it's not like Blender couldn't have all of these things. I always said that when you look at the pace of releases, even though Blender is slowing down the update cycle now, we're still getting so much more stuff than other like higher paid, I don't want to say industry standard because Blender is an industry standard now, than other 3D packages get. So we're still spoiled, but I think that with the whole give someone an inch and they'll take a mile philosophy, everyone will always expect more from the dev team. And maybe that's not a bad thing, maybe we should be pushing them. But anyway, the point is, I think they're hyper aware of the difficulties. As everyone would admit, having too many concurrent projects is difficult. That leads to energy and attention getting spread too thin. Many projects and small teams are at the risk of projects dragging on for too long, when any emergency emergency arises. It leads to frustration and the feeling that we could have done better. The modules will continue to work and the Blender.org community will continue to help lift the quality bar for the core functionality. And on top of that, we will start 2024 finishing projects. In any development project, specifically for software like this, I think there is a kind of golden zone, a Goldilocks zone, where there is a perfect number of people that can work on a particular project to get the maximum amount of progress. Too many cooks spoil the broth and too few people might not have the necessary skill sets or experience or perspectives to make something effectively and that will actually be useful. Combined with that, I think it's also important to take in uh, community opinions, but not every community opinion. That's something you learn very quickly from raising an audience. Most opinions are sh <laughs> Whoops. But some opinions that get kind of, I don't know, buried away for one reason or another are really, really good and often come with genuine use cases. For example, in the Blender community, we're quite lucky because we've got a lot of independent artists that have their own goals and do a lot of research and development and experimentation all on their own just because it's fun. Research and development has traditionally been something that companies would pay people to do to push the boundaries and see if they can uncover any techniques which could then be made proprietary for use in whatever they were making. Right? The Blender system is a bit different because we're more inclined to share things with the community. But that also means that those techniques which are developed or new knowledge which is obtained in any form is then also shared with the development team. Now this is especially important for new features like geometry nodes. But we have people like Cartesian Caramel. Let's add one coin to the Cartesian Caramel jar who like to push the boundaries of these features and therefore discover new information specifically about what is most useful and what features should be made to help people maximize the use of that particular feature. Personally, I don't think that the Blender development team has have found that Goldilocks zone. And it's probably something that's maybe almost impossible to obtain because for every area of Blender, it's going to require different sorts of skill sets and experience. And some areas are going to get more love from the community than others, etc. But I think they are aware of it. For the first call to the goal, be finishing the following projects. The extensions platform. This one was for allowing you to kind of like auto update add-ons, which were compliant with the GPL license, which developers would put onto this web platform to kind of make it easier to, what's the word, synchronize, syndicate for all of the different users. GPU-based compositors, so it's going to massively speed up the performance of the compositor. Again, that's something that's been a bit overdue, but I mean, the real-time compositor features we've been getting uh, are brilliant. It's really amazing to see a speed up in that regard. I always said in the past, there was this weird dissonance between softwares where why would it sometimes take like half a minute to put a lens flare on a blender frame using the compositor where you can put like 60 running in real time in a game engine like Unity just like that. So using the GPU is going to help with this. It's nice to see some things migrating onto the GPU as well because in a recent video that I did about whether you actually need a good GPU to make the most out of Blender, I did kind of point out that actually a lot of the software is CPU based. So if you're developing a system which is going to maximize your creative potential, you want to kind of keep it more balanced than you would expect. 
but specific components, highly dependable kind of projects are going to be doing and what requirements they have. EV Next is going to be super popular. I mean, EV has already been a really popular feature in Blender since its release in 2018, I think, was it, with the Code Quest? But it's lacking in a fair number of features and performance. That's what EV Next is going to try and cover. Grease Pencil 3.0 and Brush Assets. Projects like Geometry Nodes and Vulcan will be put on hold for the time being. That's a controversial bit. Sorry, everyone. The Geometry Node still needs a lot of work done to it, and it feels like we're already kind of on a roll of it. It'd be a shame to stunt it right now, especially when it's getting a lot of attention. Again, assisted by key creators in the community who keep giving massive publicity to Geometry Nodes just by sharing the stuff they're making online, which then gets shown to key members of different areas of industry, like visual effects, game development, etc. And believe me, there is a lot of interest for it. So it does seem like a weird one to stop, especially when compared to things like Brash Assets or the extensions platform, both of which I know probably have their own good key followings. But again, I personally feel like maybe Geometry Node should be higher up on the list. High priority issues and community patches for these and other modules will still be handled once a week. So that's fine. Not completely abandoned, just taking a bit of a step back so they can focus on completing other projects. The character animation project will still be the sole priority of the animation and rigging module during this year. That's fine. I'm not much of an animator, but I know that animation features in Blender are very significant and severely requested by a lot of people, again, particularly in industry. I think a lot of people would agree with that as well. I mean, animation seems like one of the things that people are most likely to come to Blender for. And what I mean by that is the future rests on the youth, right? And young people come to Blender for all manner of different reasons. But given the rise of YouTube over the last decade, we are seeing more and more extremely high quality animation content and also really popular shows like Arcane. And people are looking at these things. Oh, and Spider-Man, of course, going, oh, I get such like a visceral emotional reaction from these things. I want to give that experience to someone else, I want to learn how to make these things. That's where a lot of people are coming in from. And a lot of that is animation centric. Definitely doesn't mean you can't make emotional experiences like that without animation. I think there's probably a whole subset of a genre there that people might not have explored. But I think that is one of like the main feeds that people are coming in from. Emotional connections to animation and video games. So the point of all of that is to say that it'll be interesting to see where animation goes. Maybe I should invest more time into learning about it so I can connect more people that want that with the right information. Extensions platform. Blender Foundation will launch an official community moderated website for sharing, discovering and downloading add-ons, themes and asset libraries. I do appreciate that it's not just add-ons, it is also themes and asset libraries. I have my own theme, maybe I'll share it on there, maybe I won't. Again, I have my own add-ons as well. I don't know whether I'll make use of the extensions platform yet. It feels like something I should make use of, but obviously it's easy to say I will in theory, but when it actually comes to using it in practice, so long as it's easy to upload something to. A little while ago, I ended up like cutting down the number of stores that my projects were placed on just because having too many things to upload to was mentally draining and with kind of like attention deficit issues it's hard to remember like every minute thing for every task you want to do but we'll see it depends how it's designed in the end we'll see what the integration looks like this project consists of two parts an online platform and the blender integration the next steps will be to support a new schema design discussions about blender integration and a breakdown no of the next tasks. GPU-based compositor. This project adds a new compositor backend, taking advantage of GPU acceleration to be performant enough for real-time interaction. Wow, superb. I will say another reason this is important as well is because there are a lot of styles in artwork that rely on post or compositor work. We don't see that as much in this community, but there are certain styles, like for example, imagining like drawing effects over a piece of artwork or something like that. That's something you can do in 3D, especially now with grease pencil and geometry nodes, but certain types of stylization require the compositor. So it's difficult for certain types of artists to work with that in Blender if it is significantly lacking in the performance department. The initial version was added in the 3D viewpoint in Blender 3.5, the real-time compositor. Nearly all nodes are supported now. Thank God we have the fog glow working in the glare node now. The remaining work is to make it production ready for final compositing, adding render passes and other missing features to unify the behavior across CPU and GPU compositing. Excellent. EV next. Blender's real-time rendering engine, EV, has been evolving constantly since its introduction in Blender 2.8. Yeah, there we go. I knew it was the code quest. The current goal is to make EV ready for the latest hardware innovations and new techniques. This is a massive refactor which has been going on for a few years. Although the original target was to stick to feature parity, a few new features were added already like screen space global illumination and displacement support. Okay, displacement support, good. Screen space global illumination. Screen space is good, but not 
when compared to cycles, obviously. I was kind of hoping that maybe there could be some kind of innovation. Maybe this is already a thing that they've been doing or not. I don't know. I'm not technically minded about this, but where they could run cycles and EV kind of in parallel a little bit. So you get global illumination information from a virtual cycles sample that's basically running and then providing the information back to EV so that you get like real global illumination that's not screen space, but just by taking some of that core info from a cycles pass. I mean, since it's already there, but then again, you know, maybe there's a really technical thing about it being difficult to synchronize performance between something that's sample based and something that's like based on creating a rasterized frame. Maybe there's too much of a sacrifice in performance there. I don't know, just a thought anyway. Maybe someone will call me stupid for that. At the moment, it's available in the daily builds, but it still lacks some key features and it has performance problems with integrated GPUs, which makes it unclear which blender it will be ready for. Grease Pencil 3.0. Grease Pencil is undergoing a full rewrite. Wow, I didn't actually know it was a full rewrite. Rewrite? Re re Oh my god. Re right? Aiming to lay a solid foundation for the next 10 plus years, it will lead to increased performance and memory usage and pave the way for new features, e.g. geometry nodes. So a lot of people do use Grease Pencil and it's picked up more attention recently as well. Uh, it's definitely worth watching the talks from the latest Blender conference, uh, the Spider-Verse ones as well, which discuss Grease Pencil. Personally, in my community, my Discord community, I've been hearing or seeing as well from more people that have been using Grease Pencil. There are more Grease Pencil focused creators, I think Cavandrum's one of them. So yeah, this one will be appreciated. The new iteration of Grease Pencil is available as an experiment feature in Blender, and there are still many features that need to be ported. While geometry node support was planned for after feature parity, it is already in Blender. The asset system and browser will fully support brushes for painting and sculpting, that is good, and I imagine this will be useful for opening like a whole new avenue for products for Blender as well. I say products, when I say products it doesn't just mean paid products or high priced things, not to over like capitalize Blender. Products also refers to free things as well, stuff that you may see on the extensions platform in the form of asset libraries. This is one thing I like about Blender, it's kind of industrious and resourceful in this way. When it adds new feature sets, that is more potential for things for other people to create, to share with the community, which increases like the vibrancy of all the stuff people have available to play with, especially when they're coming into Blender to learn it. But yes, also it opens more avenues for people to make a living off of Blender. For example, someone could totally make a passive income from just selling brush assets for painting or sculpting. And in this age of immense corporate layoffs, particularly for the games industry, giving more diverse artistic areas the potential to do this is only a good thing. And it's going to allow more sub-communities to grow around Blender. The initial targets are already in Blender since its 4.0 version, the all asset library and yet to be polished asset shelf. The main part of the project, brush assets themselves, got a redesign recently which will allow for direct creation of assets without the need of the originally proposed draft system. I have no idea what that is, but if you click through you can learn about it. Again, I appreciate that Delay actually takes the time to put these together because it gives us a really good idea for what the features will look like. And that's a breath of fresh air in an industry where corporations often don't don't talk about their plans and change their minds on a whim. So coming back to general discussion about the project management, finishing a project will be followed by a buffer to look back at the different modules and catch up on issues and patches. Then shortly afterwards, at different moments during the second quarter, we have interesting projects lined up. Pipelines and assets, sculpting and painting, physics and simulation, so this will probably be coming back to GeoNodes, tablet input mapping, interesting, and GPU projects. So that's going to be interesting. What kinds of GPU projects? Does that mean migrating more feature areas in Blender over to the GPU for better performance? I hope so. It'll be interesting to see which they are. Most of these projects need to have their design fleshed out in order to pinpoint their scope and planning. This will happen during the first quarter or ultimately before the project officially kicks off. We're nearly at the end of the blog post here. There are three releases planned for 2024. So that's 4.1, 4.2 LTS and 4.3. Again, if you don't know, LTS means long-term support. So if you're a studio and you want to work with a more reliable version for long-term projects, then you would tend to want to stick with the LTS versions. These versions tend to get extra care in the form of like more patches as well further down the line, as far as I know. To be honest, from my perspective as an independent creative, it doesn't really matter which version you use so long as it is relatively stable, but having an LTS version tends to give more confidence for more corporate studio entities that want to like standardize pipelines with Blender as a part of that. In April, the first North American Blender conference will take place in Los Angeles. So to answer the question, will I be going? No but I would like to, but I probably won't be. I really, really, really want to meet my American Blender friends. However, things are just a little bit complicated at the moment. We've got a lot kind of going on here at home. I've also just done quite a lot of traveling. There's house stuff, health stuff, and it's kind of happening, I think, just a bit too soon for me after the last Blender conference that was in October. Maybe something will change at the last minute, but I would say don't count on me going to this one at this point in time. I have been to Los Angeles before, and I do, well, this is going to be controversial, but I'll say it anyway, I prefer going to America than to Amsterdam. I was going to say the Netherlands. The Netherlands is beautiful, but I never really liked Amsterdam. 
On the contrary, I spent practically, I think, a year of my life in America combined. I don't know, I'm more used to that kind of culture. And I would be really interested in seeing what the, the fan and creator culture is like at the American Blender Conference. What kinds of people end up going to it that weren't able to before because Amsterdam was too far for them to travel to. So yeah, it might be a bit of a shame if I don't go in the end, but I'm glad that it's happening because I think the Blender heads in America should have access to a more accessible place where they can connect with each other. Cycles, USD and other modules will still continue their usual development. Nice. There are ideas already for the third and fourth quarter, but they will be announced close to the date to keep the planning more realistic. Good, I would say, because we know about the phenomenon of announcing things too early, psychologically triggering an early sense of reward, therefore triggering a sense of relax, therefore triggering a lack of progress. Better to set expectations low and then surprise people, I would say, than the opposite. Medium and long term list. Blender apps, unknown yet. We like resources for it. Layer texturing with a bit of luck. It starts second half of 2024. There is a big demand for this one because we've seen that there are, I think, multiple add-ons trying to add layer texturing to Blender. Well, I say trying, succeeding to add layer texturing to Blender. And move to Vulkan might be second half, depends on GPU projects. Again, I appreciate transparency in the unknowns as well. To follow new developments, keep an eye on the Blender Code blog. And on behalf of everyone, I hope you have a great 2024 and happy blending. Thank you very much, Delight. Oh, product manager. Okay, so that's the title I should be using. Okay, nice. Interesting to know about some parts in there which may be slightly controversial, I think, about priorities, but I think most people understand why. Blender has a little bit of a history now, the last few years of announcing things which are subsequently delayed and delayed, but that's certainly not the case across the board. It's a very difficult project to manage, and we need to remember that Blender is a unique kind of funding environment, has many different sources of funding, and it relies on not just the grants, but also people like us giving donations. So I recommend, if you do make use of Blender, if you love it, if it's become an important part of your life, please consider donating. Either a one-time donation or subscribing to the Dev Fund. Alternatively, you can pay for the Blender Studio subscription, which gives you access to extra educational content and files, which is nicer than to provide. Also, I will say, don't feel too bad if you don't have money to contribute to Blender, because if you use Blender, if you share your artwork online, if you just help to make the community a more positive space and a safe place for creative experimentation, then I think you are still contributing to Blender quite a lot. Blender is nothing without its funding, or well, maybe not nothing, but the funding won't exist without a community that respects it. And on that point, actually, before we close up, just talking about like donations for free projects. One thing I've noticed, because again, I have my own free projects in the forms of add-ons, artistic resources, like community projects as well. People do donate, even if you don't ask them to, but it depends on where people get a sense of value. Because I've seen discussions about this elsewhere as well, saying, no, it's not worth it. You can't make a living if you put all your stuff up for a pay what you want price. Generally, that's true, but there are caveats. People don't donate on free things if they don't have a sense of value and if they don't respect you. The only way people are going to give something on a free project is if they respect the cause and if they feel like, truly, genuinely, it's something that they would have paid for anyway. It is very difficult to convince people sitting on the fence to actually take that leap, but I don't think necessarily we should be actively trying to convince people to do that, rather taking the higher ground and just saying, look, we're just here, we're taking the difficult road, we're trying to make something nice, we're doing it for a good reason, a good philosophy. If you want to, you can, but you're still important to us, even if you don't feel like you can contribute right now. But that's why a Blender also has other ways of making money, like they have their own merch store, as well as a studio. So these are other ways of allowing people to obtain value in exchange for money. This is something creators in the community do as well, which I think is very similar to the way the Blender works, in the way that we have free products, we have paid products, and effectively the funding is mixed so that the support contributes to all of it. Now, the reason I'm saying this, even though it seems a bit redundant, is that I had some discussions at the last Blender conference speaking about contribution contributing to Blender, how we all contribute in different ways. And I remember thinking back to when I announced the modular workspaces add-on, how it was something I was quite proud of. It was like the first add-on I had made that I put a price tag on. It also contained artistic stuff that I had made. It was one of the favorite things I've made. Then I got a comment from an industry professional who had come along to the video and said, effectively, God, they hate that there are so many add-ons. It's too much to keep track of. Why don't you just contribute to Blender instead? Which is quite demoralizing because when you read that at an emotional reaction I put on Twitter, it makes you not want to make anything for anyone anymore. But I'm not backing down on this point. Again, especially in this day and age of people being laid off from companies. If your overall philosophy is in the good place, wanting to provide something for people, and you need to charge for something every now and again to stay afloat so that you can keep providing value for people, then you can do it. And don't be ashamed about it, because if you can keep yourself afloat, then you'll be able to provide more value for people in the long term.
Anyway, if you made it to the end of this video, then put, what should we do? A star emoji? I'm never quite sure which emoji to use because some emojis flag up in YouTube system as being spam. Some are fine, but some flag up as spam. So sometimes your comments disappear, which is really kind of stupid. So I have to keep like a mental list of which ones are good and which ones aren't. I'm not sure if a star is good. Maybe just let me know that you made it to the end. There is an end emoji, I think, one that literally just says end or an arrow. Never mind. If you made it to the end, thank you so much. You can support me wherever you like as well. But most importantly, have a great day, everyone. And I will see you next time.